Hello, hello, hello. I'm going to assume, as usual, that my audio is working just fine. I'm extremely tired, having not slept more than two or three hours in the last 48, and I'm gently jazzed on pain medication due to a difficult lung infection. Time to go fight the toughest bosses in the entire game. And that's not where we go to do that. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, what we're going to do now is go gain access to the DLC, which, well, the second DLC pack, which has a irritatingly convoluted process to, to getting into. What we'll need to do is go to Anor Londo, which is on this list somewhere. And uh, then head up to the Ducal Archive, which should, now that I have... Uh, uh oh. <laughs> I forgot about this lady. I'm just gonna run away from her, it'll be fine. Or you know, I could kill her in one hit, that works too. What? Oh shit! My, my, I am informed by my convenient, uh. Well, that's embarrassing. But as I said, I'm on pain medication. Um, yeah, so <laughs> thanks to my convenient team of producers, I have been informed that that was not in fact playing the stuff. So um, yeah, we have returned to Anor Londo and uh, the firekeeper of the bonfire up here turned on us because that's what she does if you attack the... Uh, if you attack the goddess in charge. Poor little Gwendolyn. Oh good, and now I can actually see the chat log on my stream manager as well, which I could not before. So, actually this might not be the best way to get that. Hmm, I'm not sure. Oh my god, he survived. Anyway, so uh, what we need to do is go up to the Ducal Archive. There is a particular trigger, and I can never remember what that trigger is which causes a golem in the archive to contain an item which then unlocks some other scripted events back in Ulusil Basin. It is possible to obtain these before going and doing the Ulusil stuff, um, not Ulusil, Dark Root Basin. It's possible to obtain this stuff before you go there for the first time if you do these four major game bosses in the correct order. However, well, there is no correct order. You can do them in whatever order you like, but there is an order which will save you having to do all of this backtracking. And uh, that order can be found on the wiki. Don't expect me to be able to tell you what it is today. Let's just refresh. So it should be at the top of this um, elevator, which is the entrance to the, the first half of the Duke's archive. And um, the inexplicable crystal golem that was just chilling in that zone. If you kill him, he drops the thing. I've done almost everything in this game now, so I should have whatever it was the trigger was. If I don't, I will pause for a second and go look it up on the wiki. Oh yeah, um, Remastered really does make it look amazing. I, I personally feel like every time I go back to the original Dark Souls now, it looks like dog shit. And then if I play Remastered, I'm like, oh, this is what it looked like in my brain when I played this originally. This is This is what it looks like in my memories. This is how I recall it. Fighting like a proper duelist this time. How many more of you bastards are there? There's this one. And he's got two buddies. And however many aggro from inside that room. I was doing so well until the end there. Anyway, what we need to kill is this thing. It seems kind of a shame, he's very invested in that astrolabe, which is an emotion we can all agree with. Jesus Christ, they do a lot of damage. I feel like I'm taking more damage than I did when I came through here originally. 
you know, I'm just gonna explode these guys. Oh, I don't, I don't need to fight properly. I'm a wizard. Welcome to Wizard Town. Population explosions. Ah, it didn't drop it. Okay, well that's uh, curious to say the least. How the hell do you unlock the DLC? Give me two seconds for this incredibly unprofessional and informal stream, which is, as I said, the result of me being two and a half days without sleep and also on some kind of medications. I also hope I'm going to be uh, able to figure it out, i.e. how to sleep. But um, yeah, so it turns out what I needed to do is go back to the cave, because what I forgot is that when that zone is reloaded, that's when the golden golem appears. Then you smash open the golden golem, then you come here and smash open this golem, and then you go back to where the golden golem was, and... Um, an interdimensional time hand will take you on the kinds of adventures that only interdimensional time hands can take you on. So, prob- oh god, where's the easiest way to get there? Hmm. Probably from the Undead Parish? It's probably very restful to be in a golem. I assume that, they, that they're in stasis in some way. Um, if that's not the case, it's inc it would just be incredibly boring. Um, you know, I spent a week lying in bed out of my brain on a bad fever um, a few months ago with COVID, so I I have I have a vague inkling of what it might be like to be trapped in a crystal golem with no hope for escape. I.e., maddening. Entirely possible to turn you peculiar. Let's uh, downgrade to merely great soul arrows, since we don't need to just fucking obliterate these things. But hey, we did it anyway. That's the real advantage to being a sorcerer, is that you just always do ten times more damage than you expect. It makes it very difficult to be some kind of, you know, friendly person with friends that you hug, because you just, you just crush them with the might of your mind. I suppose barbarians have the same problem, but with physical musculature. Jules, you're not allowed to make uh, Evangelion references because uh, it bummed you out too much and you quit watching it with me. Jules, you have to get back in. You have to get back into watching Evangelion, or else I'm going to make Melanie do it. Yeah, see, that's an Evangelion ref. Did you get that one? Mm, I can't tell. Right, we need to quickly kill as many of these things as possible, by which I mean we just need to get past them in some way. Speed of killing is irrelevant, however, I am very easily bored in my current mental state, which means I just want to murder them and move the fuck on to the toughest bosses in the game. This guy has the correct response to a wizard. Also, note how um, different their hit point totals are, despite the fact that they are ostensibly the same enemy. There's this kind of implication in Dark Souls that when you see the same enemies in different places, they're just the same, they have the same stats and everything, but that's not the case. Uh, these ones we can kill with a short stick. The other one kind of required magic. I've been thinking of adding Sekiro to the list of 
games I'm vaguely intending to stream rather than let's play. But uh, the ease or difficulty with which I have had playing this makes me wonder. I actually think Sekiro is kind of maybe a bit easier. Um, going back to this. But it's a super cool game and will be fun to play. And I should probably put my traveling ring on. Which is, of course, the rusted iron ring that allows us to run through the water. Which itself reminds me of something that um, is a, a fun headcanon I have, which is that um, why why can you only wear two magic rings in this game? A lot of um, a lot of fantasy games, you know, going back to D and D, like tabletop D and D in the seventies, would have you um, unable to wear more than a few magic rings. Usually having some kind of excuse of oh the magic energies interfere with one another, but uh, my personal belief is that like. Almost everybody in Dark Souls who's of power is a giant. Like, why am I fighting this guy? I'm a wizard. This is not what we do. This is the correct thing for wizards to do. Um, but yeah, so everybody is a giant. Giants are the ones who seem to be making cool stuff, and there was definitely a girl in this uh, golden golem. I'll, I'll tell you about the thing in a minute. As an aside from what Dusk is telling us, it's always feet with you, Bina. What's up with that? I think Sekiro could be an interesting, interesting let's play because of how interestingly it plays with Japanese folklore and the way it ties into that. There is a ton of stuff that gets lost in translation that is really interesting to look up and is the kind of research I do for my let's plays. Are they limbs or are they something else? Arms and legs are limbs. Are hands and feet limbs because they're part of your arms and legs? I think they're a different section, aren't they? They have a different term. So now that we have rescued Dusk, we should be able to buy her sorceries. We should also possi possibly um, need to go and get the, uh, the peculiar doll first, but nope, there it is. Which, now that I think about it, means we could actually have probably got a hold of, a hold of the light sorcery and uh, used it in the dark underground place. Sorry, just had to make sure I turned Discord noises off. I am Dusk of Ulysseal. It is an honor to see thee again. I shall follow thy wishes. Always nice to learn a new gesture. For a very long time, I was trapped within the crystal golem. From my home, I was taken and banished to a plane of distortion. It was there that thou came to my rescue. Long after I had relinquished all hope, so gleeful was I. My faith in you. I never realised this before, but the um, dusk crown she's wearing, which is a very useful item we'll try and get a hold of ourselves, has a chin strap. So uh, let's pick up all of these, because we might as well. Uh, except the one I can't afford, which I guess I won't. Pray summon me again. I am 
Now, because I'm very clever, we should be able to just jump straight back to where we were with a homeward bone. We'll be travelling homeward boneward. And that's my last one. Hmm. I normally stock up on these the same way I stop, stock up on arrows. Anyway, um, the, the existence of this DLC kind of makes the lore kind of curiously more complicated. It um, answers some questions and we get to meet some characters who are mentioned, but also it suffers from the issue of fantasy writers having no sense of scale because it's officially set 300 years or so before the, the main game, but that just does not make sense with the, the timeline. Wow, these guys are going to kill me. Oh my god, they're kissing. Truly a moment of absolute beauty and majesty. Did you know love can bloom on a battlefield, even between skeleton crystal monsters? We had a lot of fun here today, folks, but it's time to do murder. Also, I will be pausing to catch my breath occasionally because, as I mentioned, I have a lung infection. Hooray! See, it's kind of easy to aggro these guys on accident, um, which leads to problems. Problems for wizards. Wizard problems, if you will. Although I suppose they're technically problems anyone suffers in this zone. Well, a merry oh shit fuck to you too. Now, this time, we're going to sneak up on him and be incredibly unfair in the way that wizards love to be. Wait, he dodged? There we go, broken pendant, that's what we needed. I think that's in key items. Half of a broken stone pendant, the vine appears to originate from Ula Seal. A powerful magic can be sensed from this ancient stone, yet men of this time can neither manipulate nor sense its power, which has a distinct air consisting of both reverence and nostalgia. Ah, fair enough. Right now it's mostly just very unpleasant. It was it was kind of worse last night and yesterday, because um, I'm on the good medication today. But, um... By dint of much effort, I got doctors to pay attention to me, and therefore I have um, delicious medications of three or four different sorts to help take care of it, so I'll be fine, don't worry. Although, frustratingly, this has set me back on my, um, my Let's Play schedule. I was actually intending to have already released two episodes of the Mist Let's Play on my YouTube channel by this weekend, but um, alas, alas, I have one recorded and I have not finished some supplementary stuff I need to do. Because I've spent the last two days in a, in a brainless haze. Right, where are we going? Back where we were 30 seconds ago. Who sells, who sells Homeward Bones? Hmm. I think, I think I'm going to commit a murder. I mean, it's hardly the first time that we've commit committed a uh, completely unjustified and unfair murder, but um, it's always fun to continue to do those sorts of terrible things. So I'm going to zoom up these stairs and go see if the undead merchant has homeward bones for sale. In fact, actually, no, I know he doesn't, so I'm not going to bother murdering him after all. However, I think the moss lady does, which is good for her and good for us. Um, and even if she doesn't, moth to her items are useful.
This is uh, the one time at which I suppose priests have an advantage because they can actually cast Homeward, the miracle tied to the bones, as a spell whenever they like, provided they have it tied to an attunement slot, which they never ever do, because it's a waste. Where's your nose? I wonder if the fence can save her from brain spears. I don't want to murder her though, because she's so nice. Homeward bones, yes, there we go. I'll stock up on these, but we won't be using nine of these throughout the rest of the game, because that would be insane. Right, which means now we just need to go see our good buddy Andre. Andre the Nutter Giant. I wasn't going to murder this undead merchant, I was going to murder the other one who drops a cool weapon. Um, but I can't be bothered to run up there and do that, so I'm not going to. He lives to swindle another day, by dint of being too much effort to murder. I think Andre is just a large guy. I think he's just a big lad. Where the fuck are we going? We're going to see Andre. Via the Undead Parish. I suppose one might argue that he's that he's um, on the scale of the gods, but I don't think that's the case. He's a lot smaller than Gwyn when we eventually fight Gwyn, and that's Gwyn diminished. He's also he's smaller than um, Gwendolyn, even who is the smallest god, the daintiest. Look, see, he he is the size of a man. He's just a large man. He's squatting slightly. But he's not, like, he's not an enormous heap of meat, is what I'm saying, you know? He's not a, he's not a, well, he's his hench, but he's not, like, he's not pure prime grade A steak. You know, he's not a buffalo ribeye. For I am but a man. Is this where we discover that you're all really into Andre? He seems kind of greasy to me. Not like in a bad way necessarily, but in like a... You know, he's been hammering in that tower for a long time with no shower and it's all kind of curdled on his skin sort of way. Kind of a... You know, kind of an auto body shop kind of guy, but like... Without the showers. Anyway, so these are the ridiculous hoops we have to jump through to get to the DLC. One of the curious things about the Dark Souls series is how willing it is to lock its narrative away behind these ridiculous hoop jumping systems. Where you have to... Um... There's nothing wrong with being into guys. Um, Lords know there has been like two men I have looked at in my life and found attractive, so they, they must exist, definitionally. Um, but... But, but, but... I think Andre needs a haircut, at least. Still, interesting, interesting, fascinating dis to discover how much of my of my viewer base is, is interested in... in um, grimy, unwashed old men. Grimy, stinky, unwashed old men who sit in a tower forever, Fiddling with their tools. You know, I may as well whip out the good magic. That's what I'm talking about. We don't need to save this for the Festival China. I mean, he is also fucking ripped, but... I think I mentioned this before, one of the things I appreciate about Andre is that he has the... Uh, the lopsided physique of a blacksmith, rather than the uh, excessively over-muscled physique of a not-blacksmith. Although the wrong arm is, is the muscled arm, which is extra funny to me. 
But yeah, so Dark Souls does have this habit of um, having having characters, narratives, and events be locked behind um, metrics that are never explained in the game. Be here at this place, at this specific point in the narrative, and you can have a conversation with a character. And if you do that, you completely change the course of their part of the narrative. Or perhaps you need to buy all of their items and then they'll suddenly be in a different part of the game. You know, you have to, perhaps you have to revisit an area of the game that you have no reason to have visited in the first place. And, you know, why would you do that? Turns out, if you're an obsessive explorer, you will just find these things occasionally. And I'm not human, even though I really ought to be. But that's fine, we can become human through whatever this peculiar thing might happen to be. As we all know, the most appropriate thing to do in Dark Souls when you see something that you don't know what it is, is to dive into it wholeheartedly without being cautious at all. I personally think it's a combination of um, the expectation that uh, people will talk and share things. After all, there is the in there is the message leaving system within the game. It's very intentional that the game's developers wanted to build a kind of a whisper network is the wrong the wrong word but like a kind of a a community of people sharing information about the secrets of the games um like that's why they encourage it with the in-game messaging system um and when this game first came out it, there was this beautiful time this beautiful period of time where it was this enigmatic mysterious experience where you kind of did have to figure things out for yourself via the cryptic messages left for you by other players and hints from from npc dialogue um, it's a combination of that and of certain players just being the types to constantly go back through areas to see if they've missed anything. Um, and discover, inevitably, that in fact they have. Oh shit, it's a boss. So, this is supposedly not the toughest boss in the game. But it might be the one I'll end up having the most difficulty with today. So I'm just going to be quiet while I fight. So, um, I was starting to notice a pattern in, a pattern in, in hubris, which is that if I talk about how I shouldn't, should have an easy time with a boss, it will kill me 15 times. And if I talk about how a boss is one of the hardest in the game, I just instantaneously body it. I do think that, um, I do think that Rock Paper Shotgun has really gone downhill. I used to love that website a great deal. It was my favourite gaming website for most of the last decade, but in the past five years I've just, like just stop going there completely like it's, it's been that like that across the board almost all kind of interesting journalistic outfits have just turned into uh content generation algorithms just like everything else in this hell world we exist in mushroom 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 wiggly 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 um there is nothing that delights me more in a fantasy setting than a talking mushroom who bestows ancient wisdoms upon you as a gm of uh tabletop role-playing games, I have pretty much always included enigmatic mushrooms. And this one wiggles. This one wiggles. Well, look at this one. From what faraway age hast thou come? Thy scent is very human indeed, but not intolerable. Ah, Princess Dusk Savior. Thy aura is precisely as she described. I thank thee deeply. For rescuing her highness the princess dusk is here no longer snatched away by that horrifying primeval human and so i must ask couldst thou once more play the savior well gee you only called me stinky thank you i am elizabeth guardian of this sanctuary 
Something of a godmother to Princess Dusk. I shall assist thee to my utmost, for I am one with the sorceries of all the sea. Like, uh, would you care to expound on that relationship? Exactly how are you her godmother? I mean, I make fun, but that's actually a delightfully fairy tale. That is like something from a from a, a traditional children's story of, uh, you know, the forest princess and her godmother, the talking mushroom. Thou shalt see further on. An abyss was begat of the ancient beast and threatens to swallow the whole of Elysium. Knight Artorius came to stop this. But such a hero has nearly a murmur of dark. Without doubt, he will be swallowed by the abyss overcome by its utter blackness indeed the abyss may be unstoppable still i have faith that princess dusk may be rescued yet thou shalt see an abyss was begat of the night without interest so she's uh the ulusil ivory catalyst is interesting because it's only available here in the DLC, which is difficult to get to, but it's also um, a spellcasting catalyst optimized for one of the lowest um, spellcasting, what do you call it, stats in the game. It actually caps out its bonus to your spellcasting at 12 intelligence, if I remember correctly. It's incredibly low. Whereas I think... I've forgotten what I'm talking about. I had a whole thing I was going to say. She mentions that um, a primordial human is the source of the problems in this area. And this kind of gets to what's weird and um, I think slightly unsoulsy about this DLC for me, which is that one of the major components of the tone of Dark Souls is that you're traveling through these places and hearing about ancient things that happened a long time ago, primordial sins and terrible elements of the past. In, uh, in this DLC, you're hearing about those things, but there are also things that are happening, like, right now. It's supposedly very recent that this terrible stuff happened, because Dusk of Ulusil is here, and she's, like, 15. Or 20, or something. Like, she's not, she's not an old-ass lady. So this downfall has not happened over a long period of time. But then you come through this place, and we find ruins, and garbage, and trash, and the ruins don't... They correspond in terms of physical location to the current ruins in Darkroot, but they don't correspond in terms of the architecture to the ruins of Darkroot. Oh, Grody. Big slime. For uh, fans of slime, this might be another popular episode. Or chapter, I guess. The fuck is... Oh, that's a giant. <laughs> or more accuracy, is it... Where more accurately, it is a stone giant, which are ostensibly the precursors of the um, giant stone guardians that we fought in in modern modern Dark Root. But uh, well, this is going to be a shortcut later. Try rolling. Clearly, some people have fallen for try rolling since there's like five blood stains here. Either that, or people are just bad at standing on lifts. Cringe Lifts Fail Compilation 2021. But yeah, so there's a lot of things that don't add up with the sort of idea as presented of this zone, which is that it's Dark Root 300 years in the past. For one, 300 years is not enough time. For two, it's ruined and destroyed, but this ruin has come on it very, very quickly, but it's all old and stuff. Secondly, if this is the end of Ulusil, um, and the start of it becoming a much more wild Dark Root Garden, how exactly have the uh, how exactly have the stone giants progressed from these much cruder sort of bulky, chunky heaps of rocks into the elegant statues that they are in the modern day? If that's the case, how does that make any sense? It doesn't, and I'm probably gonna die. They blend in a lot more <laughs> easily with the environment, so I tend to aggro more than I intended, which means that we then have to deal with them. On the other hand, they do tend to die to explosions just like everybody else.
So yeah, uh, I personally, I, I have this weird feeling that Ulysil was maybe intended to be something other than it was, or there were just maybe some compromises made, or some, some changes made. Um, or maybe there was like inconsistent communication between designers and uh, writers and so on. But it just, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't add up, and it, it doesn't not add up in the way that strange, mysterious things in Dark Souls don't tend to add up, i.e. It's, it's strange and evocative and it's supposed to make you think, but it just kind of feels incorrect, like, like not done properly. Well, the issue with the timey-wimey ball thing is that, that it is stated somewhere that this takes place canonically 300 years, roughly, before the main game, which, as I said, doesn't add up uh, with the time stuff. I might refrain from running around in this area and gathering every item because there's just a ton of these guys to fight and I don't especially enjoy them as enemies. Not least because they can and will kill me in one hit if I'm not careful. Or maybe two hits with the amount of hit points I have. Which means I'd have to be quiet while focusing in order to fight them properly because I can't talk and fight at the same time, I say. Mostly- oh! I don't have the patience for um, working my way through all of the guys of Ulaseel, so I'm just going to zoom on through. But um, regardless of all of the other stuff of this area, there's some. There is this tonal problem. Even if even if the timeline made sense, there is this strange departure from the usual Dark Souls tone, where you have. It's not something terrible happened thousands, an ambiguous number of ancient years ago. Um, it is, oh shit, something bad is happening right now. And this mythical mythical figure of legend, the Knight Artorius, this legendary cool guy that you've heard of in the main game, he's here. Like, he's, he's running around doing stuff. Like, why don't you go find legendary figure running around and doing stuff, Knight Artorius, and go help him with his quest. And that's just very, um, very much like other RPGs might have a, a narrative like that, which doesn't feel very soulsy to me. It feels unsoulsy. This might be more effective than exploding them with my brain, which is not something you ever really want to say as a sorcerer. Also, these ones wear clothes. What's up with that? Also, presumably, these um, scarecrow things are the uh, precursors of the, the bushes in uh, the present day version of this zone, which is itself interesting. Did they go feral? Did they become wild? Probably, yes. Also, incidentally, I know not many people are watching right now, however... Uh, it's worth bringing up that I um, realised that one of the games I put on the poll for what I will stream next with my regular streams after Dark Souls probably won't run on me, my PC. Deathloop, Deathloop won't run on my PC, so I've, I've deleted that poll and replaced it. So if you want to uh, get a vote on um, what I stream next, then uh, you should probably go to my Twitter, which is going to be this and uh, go go take a vote i'll put that in the episode description of the upload to youtube archiving this stream as well so that you can go do that it'll be around for a week what i'm planning to do is oh by the way they show some kind of intelligence here that one tries to lure you into a trap two two of these guys drop down behind you and then like four more come around that corner so I like that theory, but it's interesting that um, a less restricted story somehow just ends up being far less soulsy. Um, oh, hey, are these guys weak to fire? Apparently not. You'd think they would be.
There are a few items around here that we could grab. I'm just mostly not going to bother because there's only like two or three of them and we don't need them and it's bad radio for me to die fighting these guys over and over. This is too many prongs. Far too many prongs. The real difficulty about fighting something that has a trident, or worse, a garden fork, is that it can stab you four times for every one time you stab it. That's why these things are so dangerous. I believe I had a whole, uh, a whole thing about the conservation of stabbing in previous, previous ancient Let's Play episodes. So let's not get into that right now. Is that moss or snakeskin? That's just moss. Anyway, I do have I do have things in the works. I just need to not be constantly ill all of the time. But the plan is going to be that I'll uh, finish streaming Dark Souls and then I'll spend a week or so just doing variety streaming, jumping in and out of whatever I feel like, and then it will be time for whatever the next mainstream thing is. I should probably go on the other side of him at this point so that I don't get slapped off a cliff again. Yeah, see, that's interesting, and it fits in again with this kind of... I personally think that's a bit more of a sign of the weird FromSoft tendency to just remix the game immediately before <laughs> before release. Um, like, the last stage of development of a FromSoft game is to just redistribute a bunch of bosses and put them put them in the wrong arenas. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of, like, uh, development detective work that's gone into Bloodborne especially. Oh, hi! Well, hi there! You look cool. Whoa, big lad. Uh, the fuck was I talking about? Something, probably. So, um, yeah, this tendency to to just put things in the wrong place for some reason. There's there's a lot of this kind of, like, um, people are so obsessed with these games that, that there is a lot of this detective work that happens where people cross-reference developer interviews and um, look up bits of code and figure out where, like, oh, like, in an earlier version of the of the game, pre-release, this boss was supposed to be in this zone, which makes sense because their colour schemes match. Holy shit, I can backstab these guys. I'm pretty sure you can't backstab the plant ones. Perhaps it's some sign of their degeneration from uh, conscious entities. Also, this is a really nasty trap. I tend to fall in this hole every time I come through here. It's almost impossible to see, and it looks like you can just run across here, but nope. You will trip and fall and die and turn into slime. Which I think we can all agree, none of us. None of us want that to happen to us, right? We don't want to turn into s slime. The funnest thing about being me is that I have an encyclopedic knowledge of, like, weird internet fetishes while not actually sharing any of those fetishes myself. It's bizarre. I wonder if I can parry them. Actually, I probably shouldn't try because I'll die and I want to get to the bonfire, which is the eternal Dark Souls conundrum, really. But um, Bloodborne especially, as compared to other Soulsborne games, has this um, remixing done to it. It's I think it's the most like remixed Souls game. I definitely could have timed that better. So that black dragon we saw, that's Cal Oh, hang on. Actually, I'm not going to talk about Calamite just yet because... Oh, okay. It's just a dead guy with some arrows. That's cool, I guess. Um... The fuck was I talking about? Um... Elizabeth mentions that the cause of all of the terrible things happening here is this primordial human 
This will be the uh, final boss of this zone, which is Manus, Father of the Abyss, who has in some way cultivated the existence of the Abyss, brought it about. Um, how he's done that is anyone's guess. It's, you know, it's Dark Souls. We don't explain things here. That's not how we do. Um, but the difference between the Abyss in this place and the Abyss at the bottom of... Um, New Londo is kind of fascinating. The abyss here has a physical presence. This black slime is is the abyss itself. Which does not match how it was presented as an absence of stuff, a, a nothingness, an emptiness. So perhaps it's darkness taking on physical form, and perhaps that's what they originally intended for the uh, the abyss, but it is not what they ultimately put in the work. I will never get tired of the little watering cans on these guys' arms. They're really endearing. Presumably they were enchanted to, to do the gardening for the people of Ulusil and the, the farming and all of the tedious um, manual labour. Ulusil is from the same cycle because we know that canonically it uh, this sequence of events takes place 300 years before the events of the main game. Uh, which means it's part of this same cycle. Also, Dark Souls 1 is the first iteration of the cycle of the flame. It is the first time this has ever happened. I, orig I back when I did my original Let's Play seven years ago, I was adamant that this cycle had repeated thousands of times. But um, I don't really remember what my justifications for that were. And honestly, they seem kind of spurious to me now because, you know, the final boss of the game is Gwyn himself, hollowed and husked. However, there are characters who mention this endless cycle of the sacrifice of the undead to the um, to the flame for the prolong prolongation of the of the age of flame itself. So, you know, it's Dark Souls. It's intentionally ambiguous and does not add up. Oh. That explains why I'm not healing. Whoops. So, no, Ulusil is definitely from the same cycle, and it's likely that this is the first cycle. This is the first iteration of a cycle that will then go on to continue many, many, many times. Um, either with... Well, <laughs> canonically, I believe the ending of Dark Souls 1 is that the flame is prolonged, because Dark Souls 3 very much has uh, reality continuing to have broken down over endless, endless iterations of this cycle and endless, endless sacrifices. I actually think Dark Souls 3 is really interesting in that respect because this, the idea of um, the sort of backups and the backups for the backups and all of these fail-safes that the universe has to prevent this sort of thing from happening eventually being turned on one by one. <laughs> However, um, you know, there is the there is the alternate universe in which you choose to end the cycle by following uh, Darkstalker Kath's ending. And um, that's not what we'll do because we haven't taken the right uh, narrative path, but it, it exists in an alternate universe. And the existence of those alternate universes is semi-canonical to Dark Souls, because Dark Souls be like that. This gardener dude... Okay, so you came in late. We are currently 300 years in the past from the main game, uh, playing through the DLC pack, the second DLC pack, which is called Artorius of the Abyss and um, involves time travel. And not the wishy-washy, sort of ambiguous, confusing, weird time travel of the main game, but like full-on, straight up, we went through a portal and now it's 300 years ago time travel. So these gardener dudes are um, the last remnants of the original inhabitants of the area that will become Darkroot in the main game. Um, 300 years ago, these were the enchanted servants made out of natural materials whose job it was to do all the manual labor for the people who lived in that city over there, which we will be visiting shortly, keeping to the Dark Souls tradition of letting us have a look at environmental areas which are currently just backdrops, but which are one-to-one -one accurate to areas we will be traveling through later. So yes, this is this is in fact actually um, it uses the same map as um, Darkroot Basin in the or Darkroot Garden rather in the uh, the base game. It's exactly the same map. It just has uh, a bunch of new plants added to it, and the enemy types 
changed out and the enemy positions swapped around, so um, it's, a, it's kind of a remix of the same area. But if you remember the bushes in uh, original basic flavor Dark Root, these um, these guys are the precursors of the, the ambulatory bushes that, that jump out of the ground and fight you. Which makes sense, they were once enchanted to be alive for the purpose of uh, cultivating the plants of this area, but after generations of no humans to maintain them, they've just become actual living ambulatory bushes. Similarly, the uh, stone stone guardians in this area are the precursors of the stone guardians in modern Darkroot, but this was an inconsistency I was talking about earlier. Uh, the These ones are big and clunky. Like, that's to imply that, like, well, this is the past, right? This is the earlier version of that magic, that technology. Except that this is also the apocalypse that has come to these people. Nobody is left alive in Darkroot except for one person, which is Dusk of Ulasil. Um, and presumably she lives the rest of her life here and then dies because we find her clothes right by the portal that takes us to this area after we... Um, after we have talked to her and she has gone back to her own time. Oh my god, my bloodstain. Ooh, do I want to try and grab my bloodstain? If I jump off here, I'll die. Uh, there's no easy way to get back over there. <laughs> I don't think I had that much in my bloodstain, so it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to go grab that shiny, shiny item. I'm also going to be taking breaks from talking occasionally today on this stream because uh, for those of you just joining, I have bad chest infection and it sucks and I don't like it. These towers correspond more or less to uh, the positions of towers in, in modern dark root, but let's not fall the fuck off this edge. But they're about as ruined as they, as, they, as they are in the modern day, except that all of the rest of this architecture is gone. None of this stuff is there in the modern day. So the timeline of 300 years just doesn't make sense. It's not long enough for that stuff to disappear. And the sort of like, time is weird and broken because the universe is broken and drifting in and out. Also doesn't call. Oh fuck! Ah, uh, this is gonna be. Yep. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Okay, so I'm gonna sprint past everything I've already fought because I can't be bothered to go through that again. I'm not strong enough. So instead, I'm going to do my best to just avoid things and get past them. In fact, I might be able to equip a ring that will help. Although which one it is, is up to interpretation. Uh, let's go with Chloranthi ring, get the extra stamina regen. I believe it stacks with the Grass Crest shield and the ring of favor and protection. So as you can see, our stamina is regening very nice and quickly now. But yeah, um, I find this area really frustrating because it has a bonfire at each end and 10 million goddamn enemies in the middle, all of whom are a huge pain in the ass to fight. But yeah, so who Manus is and what his deal is is kind of fascinating. The fan community consensus was kind of always that he was the furtive pygmy, so easily forgotten. <laughs> in fact, so forgotten that of all of the gods mentioned in the intro, he's the only one who does not appear in the game. Um, so... That's understandable because he's kind of called the father of the abyss here and the abyss is very heavily associated with the dark which was of course the pygmy's chosen sphere of power but he's also i mean he's also referred to as the first man <laughs> which is funny because he's called manus this is kind of like lordran the learned of the ancient lords manus the first of men and um yeah so given all of that like, it's not unreasonable to make that assumption. On the other hand, um, oh, and the, the association between Dark and humans is very strong in Dark Souls as well. Dark is eventually revealed in Dark Souls 3, 
Although, as I have said many times, that was not intended at this point. At this point, there was no real intention behind any of this weird evocative stuff that interacts with each other narratively. Um, there was just an idea to put a bunch of weird evocative stuff in a game and let players sort of come up with their own ideas of how they relate to each, each other. Um, the fuck was I saying? So, yeah, Manus is um, referred to as the first human, but there were theories when this first game came out that there were... that, uh, you know, humans were descended from the furtive pygmy because, you know, what is a pygmy to a giant? Well, it would probably be human-sized, and we know that Gwyn's people were giants. I'm just going to explode these guys, because I, I... Or, you know, they might just kill me before I get the chance. Which is the traditional way of dealing with wizards. I mean, I'm pretty sure they put Womanus in. There's bound to be mods for that. Have you looked on Nexus recently? Right, time not to fucking die like a moron. Where's my bloodstain? Where's my bloodstain? I died in this lift. Where's my bloodstain? I want my bloodstain. Oh, I have it. That's weird. I don't remember picking... Does anyone remember me picking up my bloodstain? Because I don't. Um, And it only happened... A moment ago. <laughs> wow, my memory is terrible. So we've dealt with um, what can be the toughest boss in the game, often for people, which is the Sanctuary Guardian, to get into this zone in the first place. The bonus boss of this zone is Calamite, the Black Dragon that we saw briefly, and uh, you know what? He is often called the toughest boss in Dark Souls, but hey, so is Manus, the mandatory final boss of this zone. So this is somehow the zone in Dark Souls that has the three toughest bosses in Dark Souls and they're all the toughest boss in Dark Souls. So I think it really does come down to your build and your, your player skill. You know, are you good at dodging? Are you good at parrying? What's your thing that you're good at? You know what the not the toughest boss fight in Dark Souls is? It's the fight with Artorius himself, which we'll be go going and doing after we meet popular character, the Joker from Batman. But we're both travelers. We ought to help one another out. Sure, why not? Did you happen across Knight Artorias? The legendary Abyss Walker from the old tale. Have you heard of the High Elves? If you haven't, it's just as well. He's a colorless sort, if you ask me. <laughs> this dude is like the least least sense-making dude in all of Dark Souls. Why is he dressed like he's from a completely different era? Well, I guess time's breaking down. Um, his attitude is totally different to everyone else's. He's really weird and I love him. He also sells some very useful items. Uh, none of which I'm actually gonna buy. Well, I mean, let's get some green herb. Because we all love that green herb, am I right? Anyway, he does uh, a thing that Dark Souls characters love to do, which is to tell you that you're buddies and then invade you later. But before we go deal with that, we're going to unlock this lift. Which means that instead of a stupid uh, trek to go back to the bonfire, we now have a nice shortcut. Since this is the first one of these towers we found. I am actually going to go back to the bonfire and turn human, because I like to attempt every boss fight human for the first time. But... Um, it's cool that they give us more story on, on Artorias and actually expound on who he is, but I do think, as I've said so many times, that it takes away from this mysterious tone of Dark Souls to actually have you meet people. Um, there's something delightful about... Uh, yeah, this is the right way. There's something delightful about the way that all of this mythic stuff happened a long time ago and you're sort of just trudging through the dregs of the world. Um, the idea that it's only been 300 years since these mythic heroes last walked the earth doesn't just just doesn't tally with what the rest of the game is. This is also a really nice um, visual design for an area. It's very mysterious and curious.
Anyway, we're going to turn human. And then we'll upgrade this bonfire, which we love to do. And then we will go fight Arturius of the Abyss. And we will discover that, despite the legend being that Arturius made some kind of a pact with the creatures of the Abyss that allowed him to traverse freely within it, that's not exactly true. Arturius, uh... Huh. I, does that... Does the mask have a lump on the front? I literally never noticed that the mask of the child has a has a lump on the front before. Ouch. I'm just going to knock things off my desk casually for a second, like an irritated cat. Uh, right. So, um, yeah. This DLC contains the three toughest bosses in uh, the original Dark Souls, but it also contains one of ev the most favourite bosses. Everybody loves the fight with Artorius. It's a thrilling duel with a mighty swordsman if you happen to be a melee build. It's less that if you are a sorcerer, which is the consistent problem we've been talking about all the way through the game, which is that if you're a sorcerer, you just kind of destroy things. <laughs> but it is interesting, and he has become infected with the abyss in some way. Um, and there is this uh, kind of self-fulfilling time loop go thing going on. It is only because you went back in time um, and prevented, you know, the destruction of Ulusil and all of this stuff. Well, I mean, you, you don't you don't manage to save Ulusil because it's already destroyed, but you stop the abyss from spreading, which is really the best you can hope for in Dark Souls. That's just, um, you know, when the soul gets really dark, the dark gets really going, I guess. That doesn't make sense. But actually, before we go do that, I'm going to come down here because it's going to be convenient for us to have already seen the boss that we're going to fight. So this leads into the bonus boss arena, which has the last of the immortal dragons, except for the immortal dragon in Ash Lake, who I suppose could be considered the only immortal dragon who just didn't go fuck up the ordinary world. Maybe, maybe the reason why he's still alive and having just chilling in the Ash Lake, in the primordial zone, the substrate of the world beneath existence. Like, maybe the reason he's still around is because he didn't fuck up the surface world and therefore Gwyn didn't try and destroy them. Destroy him. Um, anyway, Calamit is the last of them. The idea that one of these primordial entities still existed 300 years ago is also kind of curious, especially considering how everything is presented as ancient mythic history. Like, um, you've got to consider that, like, 300 years ago is only, like, what, six, eight granddads ago? Time is not as big as people think it is. Also, this is an enemy type that exists here and only here. They are identical to the zombie dogs from uh, much earlier in the game, except that they have scales on them and I guess are dragon dogs because there's a dragon here, maybe? Anyway, I'll stop dragging this out and we can go fight the damn thing. Calamit is supposedly the last of the actual causing problems in the world, ancient primordial dragons, to be running around doing stuff, and this is where he meets his end, but... It is a very difficult boss fight at this point. We can get an NPC to help us with it, but only if we try the boss fight here first now. So what we're going to do is go wake him up. Well, he's already woken up, but we're going to go find him. Also, interestingly, Calamit is blind, and I will talk about um, what that means for the boss fight when we uh, are actually doing the boss fight for realsies when we come back. <laughs> yeah, good luck. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fucking need it. Jesus. Um, do I want to put a Ring of Sacrifice on? No, because I only have 5,000 souls and I have plenty of hard humanity. Oh shit, that's a Crystal Turtle. Come back. Crystal Turtle, my beloved. Oh fuck. So I believe that just having seen Calamit swoop, uh, swoop through there is enough. But um, if not, we can go provoke him again later. But yeah, having uh, having seen Calamite in that boss arena, I believe we can now ask an NPC we'll make, meet shortly for help. So all of the way through Dark Souls, all of its mysterious backstory is revealed in teeny tiny hints that you get in single lines from single items that you can find. There are four rings in the game. The Wolf Ring, the Hawk Ring, the Dragon Slayer's Ring, and the other ring that I can't remember the name of. 
each of these rings corresponds to one of the four knights of Gwyn. Each of the four knights of Gwyn led one of Gwyn's, you know, military forces. So Artorius was the, you know, the chief silver knight. And, um, Gal, Hawkeye Gal was the leader of the great archers of Anor Londo. Um, Kieran was perhaps not a leader of something, but, um... Actually, now that I think about it, was Ornstein the leader of the knights? Maybe they were both knights of... Maybe they were both silver knights, I'm not sure. Anyway, the point is, uh, there are a couple of hints about these characters in the game. There's, like, maybe one voice line and two item descriptions, um, you know, about a given character. But that's what I like. I like the mystery and the ambiguity and figuring out for yourself and coming up with your own theories about what's going on. It's less fun for me or at least less fun for who I am now to actually go to this place and then meet them as real people, which we will do. Um, we've already killed Ornstein in the main game. However, the other three Knights of Gwyn are meetable in this DLC. We will fight Artorius in a moment, having become corrupted beyond all reason by the Abyss. And um, then later we will meet Kieran, the leader of his assassins, and Hawkeye Gao himself, the legendary archer. So I'm going to be quiet as usual during this boss fight because I have to focus and uh, my god, I'm really starting to flag. I'm not very well at all. Pay attention during this fight because it is worth noticing that uh, he's only going to use one arm. His other arm hangs limply. This character is beautifully animated and... Um, ties his, his animations into his character and his position in the world. Which is all something I love to see. I, I don't want your garbage. Ouch. absolutely bodied so I don't know what Ikimen means is that a weeb word I, I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a weeb so I don't know from from random individual Japanese words <laughs> except that that's kind of not true I was a teen weeb I grew out of it I swear but um yeah so uh Fighting, um, fighting Artorius is usually one of the, like, fights people remember fondly because he's, um, you know, a thrilling, a thrilling combatant. But also, he's, he's one of the few bosses in Dark Souls 1 that is similar to your scale. He's twice your height because he is on the scale of the gods of Anor Londo because he's from Anor Londo. Um... But almost all of the bosses you fight in Dark Souls are giant monsters whose butts you just quietly stab until they fall over and die and disappear. So it's nice to actually have another proper boss fight against just just an ordinary, well, an unusually large but still sort of ordinary sized man. And um, his movesets are pretty cool and fun to fight against and fun to learn and deal with. So for all of those reasons, and the fact that most most people aren't like me, and therefore they love to see the thing that they recognize, so they're like, oh, it's, it's Artorius, that guy that we heard about in the main game. That's so cool. And like, I will never criticize people for having that kind of attitude. It must be nice to be like that. Sadly, I am not. Any, or at least not anymore. <laughs> I am. I'm not even jaded and irony poisoned. I'm just not like, I'm just like, I like the ambiguity. I think it's more interesting.
shit. Okay. So as you can see, I am capable of playing bosses properly. Um, one of the main problems of, about, <laughs> about fighting Artorias as a sorcerer is that you run out of spells, uh, and then it's down to um, how good are you at dodging? As you can see, I'm pretty good at dodging, but um, one of the one of the major difficulties with fighting him is that um, that rolly that rolling air attack, the uh, the spinning vertical slam. If he hits you with the first one of those three or the second one of those three, um, he will kill you if you have a low health pool because um, that chain can hurt you when you're on the ground and the stun time is long enough that it's impossible to get back up. So if, it, if one of them hits you, the rest will hit you too. Um, but if you can keep dodging as I was, then you can generally make your way through in uh, one piece. It's a thrilling fight and I actually like to take this one with sword and shield properly. Um, but the trick I usually use when I want to get through it in a hurry is that I do the first half of the fight um, with sword and shield and then I switch to my spells for the second half when it's... Uh, <laughs> when he gets faster and more aggressive at a certain point. There's not really a separate phase but he does get more difficult in the second half of the fight, and so if you save your explosions for then, you can kill them a lot faster and you're not as likely to die. But I think I acquitted myself pretty well. Um, it was one mistake that got me killed. So we'll head back in, and if I fail again, I'm going to call it a knight. Well, I mean, I guess he is always a knight. Um, but if we win or lose, next, next, next up, I'm out, because uh, I'm very tired and not very well. One of the most important tricks to fighting him is learning which animations will give you time to heal and which animations will give you time to get one hit in or two hits in. And it's very important not to um, not to be greedy because that is what will get you killed. Horizontal spin attacks are nasty too, especially the double because it will hit you twice. It is tough, it's very tough, but it is quite fair uh, as Dark Souls bosses go. A lot of his attacks have really big windows, my problem is that I tend to get greedy. This one, for example, you can get like four hits in if you don't mind him hitting you. I do mind him hitting me though, because it will kill me. Because I am just, I am just a little wizard. I want to get I want to get about fifty percent down before I uh, switch to the heavy spells. Ooh, that was close. 
That's a mistake. Fortunately, that AoE blast is literally it's there to give you a chance to heal up and recover. Took my eye off the ball. Now that shouldn't have hit me. Ah, uh, balls. Okay. Oofed. Uh, right, my hands are so sweaty that I can't hold the controller. Um, I'm going to blame this bad chest infection and call it a night. <sighs> not a warrior, not a barbarian, not a swordsman even, but a knight. So, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for coming with me on this adventure. And uh, next time we'll pick up and hopefully we will be able to just fucking obliterate him without too much trouble. Um, I hope you enjoyed the stream. Remember, you can check out my YouTube for Let's Plays. It's currently on hiatus, but I will soon return to making in-depth, well-made Let's Plays. I don't think anybody's watching who doesn't know that, so actually I'm just going to say thanks to my Patreons. And you can support me on Patreon or Ko-fi if you aren't already and want to. And, um, yeah, there was something else I was gonna say, but I don't remember what it was, so I'll catch you next time. Thank you so much for watching.